Hello and welcome to the next video of Power to the Plurals. This is the Sorgold System and this is Skylar speaking. We are the founders of the Plural Association Nonprofit, a nonprofit for people with Dissociative Identity Disorder, DID, other specified dissociative disorder, OSDD, and any and all other forms of plurality, no matter the label people use to describe their unique and individual experience with multiplicity. And this video is exactly about that. We are going to find out together if a headmate started the New Age movement. This video is about Rupert, but we have to start at the beginning. Dorothy Jane Roberts, born May 8, 1929, was an American author, poet, psychic, and spirit medium, who channeled an energy personality called Seth. Her publication by Seth, known as The Seth Material, established her as one of the preeminent figures in the world of paranormal phenomena. Jane sadly passed away on September 5, 1984, after battling arthritis. But her and Seth's work is still recognized as important and has over the years been read and practiced by millions of people worldwide. Seth is an energy essence personality and also calls himself a being, a creature, and a personality without a body. For over 20 years, he participated twice a week in sessions in which Jane puts herself in trance so Seth can speak through her. Most of these sessions were transcribed or recorded. Seth himself also wrote multiple books, taught classes, and coined the famous phrase, you create your reality. Seth, his empowering message is considered by many to have literally launched the New Age movement. We will now show you a short video clip of Jane and Seth taped on June 4th, 1974. Well, it was after the Seth material started and this whole thing before I realized that people, you might use them or think of them as symbols, or you might, no matter how you say to them, they have their own fantastic individuality. And whenever any beliefs, even our own, blind you to that, you have lost. Whenever you relate to someone as simply a belief or you get your back up and you don't see the reality, then we want. We'll bring you closer to people. It will not divide you. If it, if it divides you, that is not what it is. I bid you good evening. <laughs> and understand your responses to our friend here. For when he speaks, you fear the vocabulary because you fear the beliefs that you still are afraid of it. You are afraid that after all, for all of your hard earned knowledge. The others are right. You are not sure of your position and therefore you must defend it uh, with a greater vehemence. And you are afraid uh, that in your heart of hearts you do not address the joyful integrity of your own being. You are afraid that after all, the old stories may be correct and there is something wrong in your creaturehood. That you are, after all, put down because you are human and that you are, after all, damned because you are what you are and that no matter what you say or do you are originally 
in one way or another them. You are afraid that there is something wrong with where you are and what you are. Now, in those terms, what you want to be is within you now and within your glowing creaturehood. You are blessed because of your being, not damn because of it. Hi, this is editing me. I just wanted to come in here and say a little bit about the video that we just watched that we heavily, heavily edited. Um, it's part of a three-part series that make up a 30-minute interview with Jane and Seth. Um, it's very old, right? So the quality isn't the best. We tried to clean up the audio and the clips that we used, uh, but it's still pretty bad. What really stood out to me in the beginning was that Jane said, if it divides you, that's not it. And I thought it was super interesting because when we look at DID and OSDD, we talk about a division, right? And, and for us, it was really inspiring to think like, huh, wait a second, like, <laughs> we like it, it, that shouldn't be there and then in a larger context outside of ourselves we see a division in the community right and not believing people's lived experience maybe or like not us and probably not you if you're watching this but maybe you have in the past um we haven't always understood people's lived experience and um and felt challenged by those moments um but listening to the people in our own inner world and in our own system um, and believing their lived experience or, or getting to a point where we could because we trusted them in other areas so much that it didn't make sense to not believe them. Um, so that was really interesting to me. And then I really liked the positivity that Seth brings um, around, um, around the self and the being and um, how we aren't doomed, and I really appreciated that. So I just wanted to put that in here, and we have also linked to the channel where you can find the full video, uh, videos, it's multiple videos, uh, with interviews with Jane and Seth if you want to watch more. Who is Rupert? Seth often refers to Jane as Rupert and uses he-him pronouns for Rupert. Personally, I'd say that Rupert is what we understand now as a system name the name we use to address a collective system. In Seth Speaks, a book written by Seth himself, it starts out with, I do not have a physical body, yet I am writing this book, which is so recognizable, right? Then it continues with, you have heard of ghost hunters. I can quite literally be called a ghost writer, though I do not approve of the term ghost. It is true that I am usually not seen in physical terms. I do not like the word spirit either. And yet, if your definition of that word implies the idea of a personality without a physical body, then I would have to agree that that description fits me. I address an unseen audience in this book. However, I know that my readers exist, and therefore I shall ask each of them now to grant me the same privilege, which is amazing. Love that metaphor. I write this book through the auspice of a woman of whom I've become quite fond. To others, it seems strange that I address her as Rupert and he him, but the fact is that I have known her in other times and places by other names. She has been both a man and a woman. And the entire identity who has lived these separate lives can be designated by the name of Rupert. Names are not important, however. My name is Seth. Names are simply designations, symbols. And yet, since you must use them, I shall also. I write this book with the cooperation of Rupert, who speaks the words for me. In this life, Rupert is called Jane and her husband, Robert Butts, takes down the words that Jane speaks. I call him Joseph. Later, he says, Consciousness creates form. It is not the other way around. All personalities are not physical. It is only because you are so busily concerned with daily matters that you do not realize that there is a portion of you 
who knows that its own powers are far superior to those shown by the ordinary self, which I love. Because the goal of our nonprofit is to empower plurals, and this sounds so import,、uh, empowering. Robert Butts, the husband of Jane, transcribed all the sessions as they called their moments together. He made very detailed notes, including timestamps, not only about what Seth said, how fast or slow he talked, but also about how deep Jane was in trance. If she felt tired afterwards, if she remembered what had happened, which often she didn't, and which facial expressions she made. By the time the book Seth Speaks started to get written, over six thousand pages of notes from these sessions were already written by Robert. That is husband material. <laughs> How it all got started. On a September evening in 1963, Jane sat down at her table to work on poetry as she often did. Butts was in his back room studio painting as he often did. It was very domestic, very normal, very unpsychedelic. She would later remember, and then, between one normal minute and the next, a fantastic avalanche of radical new ideas burst into my head with tremendous force. It was as if the physical world were really tissue paper thin, hiding infinite dimensions of reality. And I was flung through the tissue paper with a huge ripping sound. When she came to, Jane found herself scrawling the title of this odd batch of notes: "The Physical Universe as Idea Construction." In late 1963, Jane and her husband Robert Butts started experimenting with a Ouija board as part of Jane's research for her new book. According to Jane and Robert, on December 2, 1963. They began to receive coherent messages from a male personality who eventually identified himself as Seth. Soon after, Jane reported that she was hearing messages in her head. The first seven sessions were entirely with the Ouija board. The three-hour sessions on the evening of January second, nineteen sixty-four, was the first where she began to dictate the messages instead of using the Ouija board. For a while, she still opened her sessions with the board, but finally abandoned it after the twenty-seventh session on February nineteenth, nineteen sixty-four. Jane describes the process of writing the Seth book as entering a trance state. She said Seth would assume control of her body and speak through her, while her husband wrote down the words she spoke. They referred to such episodes as readings or sessions. The twenty-sixth session on February eighteenth, nineteen sixty-four, was the first held in the presence of another person, a friend. She felt there were no alarming changes in her personality. I was doing twice the creative work I had done earlier. I was satisfied with the quality of the Seth material. It was far superior to anything I could do on my own. If nothing else, I thought the sessions presented a way of making deeply unconscious knowledge available on a consistent basis. So I want to like add something in. When we write some of our articles, like during the writing or afterwards, we're like, "How did we do that? Like, where did that that come from?" And、um, it's really interesting, especially when we collaborate and like put all our knowledge together. It's really impressive. <laughs> so we really recognize that how she said it's far superior of anything I could do by myself. <laughs> Let's continue, because we were so. Innocent about psychic literature, we weren't hampered by superstitious fears about such psychic phenomena. I didn't believe in gods or demons, so I didn't fear them. I wanted to learn. Rob and I had discovered a whole new world together, and we were going to explore it. Jane assumed Seth was a subconscious fantasy, personified because she did not believe in spirits or life after death. She monitored her personality characteristics. And went to a psychologist, but she felt that Seth seemed far more mature and well balanced than the psychologist. So finally, I stopped worrying. She said, "This is not to say the experience did not cause certain strains and stresses to, that could accompany any worthwhile venture in an entirely new field." Since Jane's death, others have claimed to channel Seth. In the introduction to Seth. Seth's first dedicated book, Seth Speaks, he says communications will come exclusively through Rupert, Seth's name for Jane's collective, 
at all times to protect the integrity of the material. In the Seth material, Jane Roberts wrote, several people have told me that Seth communicated with them through automatic writing, but Seth denies any such contacts. At least one person has claimed more recently to channel Seth. Is Seth a headmate or an alter? Jane called Seth an energy essence personality. Both Seth and Jane claimed that they do not have MPD, multiple personality disorder, uh, nor DID, dissociative identity disorder, and we will dive in deeper uh, to that right now. I read this amazing thesis by Anna Preston titled New Age Channeling and Theories of Dissociation, applying a structural dissociation of the personality model to the case of Jane Roberts. This fantastic thesis, written for the Uni University of Amsterdam by Anna Preston, contains 72 pages of fantastic insight, combining psychiatric, anthropological, and spiritual views under consideration. We highly recommend you read the full thesis linked in the description in case you want to learn more. We very much appreciate how well Anna Preston explained that under the theory of structural dissociation, any and all dissociation is pathological and maladaptive. Hey, I just wanted to quickly jump in to explain what we mean by that. So under the theory of structural dissociation, um, all trauma leads to dissociation and all dissociation means trauma, basically. Um, and it is always pathological and maladaptive. It's a symptom of something that is wrong. So that means that if you do not reach fusion integration, which this theory finds the holy grail, then then you are still dissociating when you switch, which means that that is pathological and maladaptive, aka a problem in their eyes. Okay, let's dive deeper. How she included anthropology perspectives and brought her progressive views objectively. We are excited to share some highlights of this study with you as we feel this is important history for the plural community that currently not many people are aware of. Plurality is not something new. Spiritual and cultural forms of plurality aren't anything new either. Plurality didn't get invented on Tumblr or Twitter and this case in particular is extremely well documented for an extensive time period. So let's together go over the highlights of the thesis by Anna Preston. Throughout her 20-year career of channeling Seth, Jane was always questioning the true nature of the phenomenon and whether Seth was merely part of her own psyche. She writes, I was already beginning to study my own psychological behavior and the questions of Seth's independent reality came more and more into my mind. Since I become Seth in some fashion, I'm never able to see myself as Seth in the same way that Rob can. I questioned Rob constantly. How did I look? How did he know someone else was speaking? What was there about Seth that so convinced him that Seth was more than a dissociated part of my own subconscious? This passage shows that Jane was aware of the concept of dissociation, as Anna Preston points out in her thesis. Although importantly, this probably reflected a limited understanding of the term as it was popularly used at the time to refer to the cases of secondary or multiple personality. Jane writes, as to who or what Seth is, his term energy essence personality seems as close to the answer as anyone can get. I don't believe he is part of my subconscious as that term is used by psychologists or a secondary personality. She presents her own views thus, I do think that we have a supraconscious that is as far above the normal self as the subconscious is below it. It may be that Seth is the psychological personification of that supraconscious extension of my normal self. It seems then that Jane does not view Seth as a wholly separate entity or spirit in any classical supernatural sense. Rather, Seth is conceptualized as an extension of Jane's normal self. Her slash Seth's theory of the multidimensional self makes such a characterization plausible within that framework. The true self of a person, according to Seth, exists in multiple planes and levels of reality at once and is an infinitely creative expression of God or all that is. 
Thus, the appearance of Seth as a separate personality can easily be reconciled with the recognition that he is still a part of Jane. This recognition does not carry the reductive implication that he is merely a part of Jane's subconscious, because the postulation of a superconscious suggests instead possibilities of infinite expansion and growth. Our individual consciousness grows and out of it experience, it forms different personalities or fragments of itself, Jane explains. These fragments are entirely independent as to action and decision, yet the inner psychic c c components are constantly in communication with the whole self of which they are part. Metaphysical speculations aside, Jane's account of the nature of Seth is surprisingly tentative and modest, at least compared to the way many observers have tended to view her and channels generally. She tells us, this book is Seth's way of demonstrating that human personality is multidimensional, that we exist in many realities at once, that the soul or inner self is not something apart from us, but the very medium in which we exist. Seth may be as much a creation of his book. If so, this is an excellent instance of multidimensional art done at such a rich level of unconsciousness that the artist is unaware of her own work and is as much intrigued by it as anyone else. This recognition of Seth as possibly a creation or an instance of multidimensional art shows Jane to be highly pragmatic and wary of jumping to supernatural conclusions, which to her mind are actually overly simplistic. Jane is recorded as telling her ESP class on June 20, 1972. To label Seth as a spirit guide is to limit an understanding of what he is. I'm using my writing and my life to transform intuitive, sometimes revolutionary material into art, where it can be enjoyed, understood to various degrees, and stand free of the slur, stupid interpretations. The whole psychic bit as it is, is intellectually and morally and psychologically outrageous as far as I'm concerned, and, what, and I want no part of it or the vocabulary or the ideas. Jane, in fact, struggled mightily with this issue of the public's interpretation of her work and resisted being pigeonholed at every turn. The following journal entry tells us quite a bit about Jane's attitude in this regards. The psychic stuff literally came out of the poetry. As long as it was just ideas, it was okay. Science fiction too. The same ideas in a story are accepted as provocative, daring, far out, and what a great imagination you have. But start saying that this is true and look out. Do they give you a prize for writing a book? No. They want to know, is the book true? Are the ideas real? Are you a fraud? Before they were lovely, dreamy ideas. Now, suddenly, they have to compete with what people call facts. You have to work at them and live your life around them and live up to them. And everybody is watching for you to make one wrong step. So you have to watch it. You don't dare go too fast for fear of making a mistake. And they'll say, aha, the ideas are wrong. They are in fact and at all. And you are a fraud. Being Seth is fun and wildly creative beyond my understanding and anyone else's too. But it's got to be explained down to the smallest details. Prove what he is or I'm a fraud. But prove it in slur, stupid terms. Aside from her obvious expiration at having to constantly justify herself in the public eye, these passages again reveal Jane's preference for viewing the Seth phenomenon as art. This view of her channeling as an art form, a creative manifestation of abilities originating in a superconscious self existing in multiple dimensions at once, clearly bears, li bears little resemblance to a purely clinical psychological theory of the mind such as the structural dissociation model. Because Jane didn't want other people to label her and Seth his experience, Neither will we. This is my own addition. <laughs> Just to make clear, this isn't in the thesis. So here's my own little addition to this. Because Jean Jane didn't want other people to label her and Seth his experience, neither will we. 
We believe lived experience, and so if Jane says that her experience isn't accompanied by clinical distress and that she doesn't have MPD or DID, we believe her. We don't know if Jane or Seth would have applied the plural label to themselves, but with how they describe their experience, it does fit the definition. As we define plurals as anyone who self-identifies as having or being more than one individual within a single body. Okay, let's continue with the thesis by Anna Preston. Seth's perspective. Seth actually has more to say about uh, psychological theories of dissociation than Jane does. He specifically refers to dissociation in his explanation of how he is channeled through Jane, saying, I do depend upon Rupert's willingness to dissociate. There's no doubt that he is unaware at times of his surroundings during the sessions. Jane referring to Rupert. It is a phenomenon in which he gives consent and he could at any time return his conscious attention to his physical environment. In this statement, it appears that Seth is mainly referring to Jane slash Rupert entering a trance state. This state of trance, in which multiple selves can freely blend, seemed to constitute Seth's basic definition of dissociation, as the following page also indicates. I think the following page is especially interesting to gateway systems, so let's go. It is true that a state of dissociation is necessary, but because you open a door, this does not mean that you cannot close it, nor does it mean that you cannot have two doors open at once. And this is my point. You can have two doors open at once, and you can listen to the two channels at once. In the meantime, you must turn down the volume of the first channel while you learn to attune your attention to the second. This process you call dissociation. However, other statements of Seth refer to dissociation differently. An ambiguity of definition in some instances, he refers to dissociation in much the same way as Freudian repression. At other points, he uses the term in connection to the phenomenon of multiple personality, a correct designation, certainly, but one which betrays the prevailing tendency to recognize dissociation of the personality only in its most extreme forms. Regardless, multiple personality or DID is definitely the dissociative condition that most readily springs to mind when questioning the nature of channeling phenomena. Seth recognizes this and strenuously insists that his is not such a case. He states, I'm not a secondary personality. I make no attempt to dominate Rupert's life, nor indeed would I expect him to allow it. I do not re represent any repressed portions of Rupert's own being. Later, my memories are not the memories of a young woman. My mind is not a young woman's mind. I am not a father image of Rupert's, nor am I the male figure that lurks in the back of the female mind. Here, Seth can be seen to invoke and deny in the same breath possible Freudian, Jungian interpretations of his origins in Jane's subconscious. He goes on, I was not artificially brought to birth through hypnosis. There was no artificial tempering of personality characteristics here. There was no hysteria. Here, Seth reveals his knowledge of the fact that hypnosis has been used to experiment with creating alter personalities and that, historically, the study of split personality was closely linked to cases of hysteria. To sum up the emic perspective of Jane Seth, Anna Preston explains, it seems that they accept a connection between the channeling experience and the idea of a dissociative state that enables it to occur. However, they reject the idea of this experience being symptomatic of a dissociative disorder like DID. This is to be expected. No one wants the central masterpiece of her life's work to be reduced to a lucky side effect of a mental disorder. But even from an ethic perspective of hardline clinical psychology, one would be hard-pressed to explain the case of Jane slash Seth in solely these terms. From only a cursory glance at the case of Jane Roberts, it is clear that her channeling relationship with Seth does not represent a case of tertiary structural dissociation, or DID, according to the standard clinical criteria. At the most basic level, the absence of distress and dysfunction resulting from the experience preludes precludes characterization of her condition as a disorder. If we're still seeking evidence of trauma-based structural dissociation of the personality, this too appears to be ruled out by von der Hart and colleagues 
characterization of dissociation as inherently disruptive and pathological. However, it may still be possible to apply aspects of this model to cases lying outside of the realm of the plainly dysfunctional and disruptive if we also incorporate Seligman's and Kirkmeyer's insight into the power of culture and context. I love this part. It begs the question, what about Seth? Could he also be characterized as an EP of Jane? Again, at EP stands for emotional part. Again, at first glance, this does not appear to be the case. An emotional part is typically limited in the scope of its focus to those action systems which are relevant to its underlying emotional origins. A highly elaborated, seemingly complete personality such as Seth might look more like another A and P, an apparently normal part of Jane, as occurs on the clinical dissociative spectrum exclusively in cases of DID. However, we've already seen that Jane's experience of Seth was not disruptive or distressing in any way, and even approaching the typical experience of DID. In addition, if Seth was another ANP, apparently normal part of Jane, Jane being the primary ANP of the total personality, one would expect him to emerge in daily life as an apparently normal personality, which clearly he is not. An ANP, as defined in the structural dissociation model, is primarily focused on the action systems of daily living. Seth's focus is supposed to be in a different dimension of existence entirely. It could be that, in practice, it is very difficult to distinguish between a highly elaborate EP and an ANP. It could also be that these categories impose artificially distinct boundaries on a great spectrum of possible manifestations of divided personality, which themselves may fluidly shift in response to a flotora of factors. Love that. <laughs> the stress only outwardly manifests later in Jane's life, when she is suffering terribly from the same disease that eventually killed her mother. Remarkably, this issue is expressed by the emergence of another channeled entity, which characterizes itself as Jane's creative self or creator, as Watkins, Jane's frown, friend, tells us. This voice expresses Jane's beliefs in explicit, frightening absolutes. A few excerpts of this voice apparently addressing itself to both Jane and Rob as a couple should make its attitude clear. It says, I believe that you both must write and paint a reasonable amount of time daily. I was always against any jobs that would divert you as long as you were not in dire need, in which case I was willing to suspend my judgment. You began to change your ideas. I expected them to be unsuvering. When it seemed you would not police the two of you with the intense fervor necessary, I began to do so. I do not want you to go hungry or to be unhappy. I do not want you to be in want, but outside of that, nothing else concerns me but your work. My methods have not brought about what I wanted, however. Now you spend half of your time trying to figure them out, and what is wrong with Rupert? Time that you should be working. I do not care if both of you die poor, but I do demand that you live using your abilities. My demands to me are simple and reasonable. More than that, I see no others worthwhile. All you have to do to please me is work a reasonable amount of hours daily, then I do not care what you do. But I expect that purpose to govern and direct your lives to be the focus about which all other events happen, not a sideline. The harsh, uncompromising, even totalitarian tone of this voice is alarming, to say the least. It seems to be the source of Jane's immense drive and discipline. The voice goes on to claim that it is the source of Jane's illness that it generated it deliberately in order to have him, Rupert slash Jane, sit and write books chained to a chair, and that the reason Jane cannot heal herself, as she the theoretically should be able to according to the principle of creating one's own reality, is because she has become fixated on the illness at the expense of her vitally important work. If this is the voice of a dissociated emotional part, EP, of Jane, it is worth asking where such intense emotions or originated in the development of the total personality. In this case, it is not difficult to locate a possible origins in Jane's early disorganized attachment to her mother. As we saw in the earlier passage where she describes her mother's behavior, 
Jane's writing was perhaps the only area in which her mother was ever supportive and validating of Jane. I'd like to add on, um, first of all, that we skipped the part about the abuse that Jane experienced because we don't want to trigger people. Um, Seth also explains in the book, Seth speaks, this is my own opinion, right? Or my own addition, this isn't in the thesis. It's kind of hard to differentiate sometimes, but I'm trying. Which obviously, uh, the, the book Seth Speaks was obviously written from a new age perspective. It's 20 hours long, I have the audio book. It's super cool, it has three different voice actors um, reading the book together, it's great. So uh, it's long, so it's a bit hard to summarize this, but he believes that everyone has multiple selves, but they aren't in contact with each other, but they could and they probably should. And I will remind you that it was Seth who coined the term, you create your own reality. And he explains in this book um, that all personalities can and have the right to create and co-create together, which really spoke to us. We were really impressed with how Seth spoke his truth so boldly and without shame or doubt. For example, there is this moment in the book where Seth explains about reincarnation and he boldly states that he died and was born more times than he could count. We thought it was awesome he shared his lived experience in this way, even if we don't necessarily agree with all of his vision. Also, there are many more books, so in all fairness, I can't say I know, all, I know of all, let alone understand all about his theory, thoughts and beliefs. In the next part of the thesis, the main source referenced is by Rebecca Sellingman and Lawrence J. Kirkmeyer's comprehensive and well-argued art article, The Sociative Experience and Cultural Neuroscience, Narrative, Metaphor, and Mechanism from 2008, which we highly recommend you read in full. We will make another video on it because this got too long, <laughs> uh, but it was really good. So their point um, is this. Theoretical approaches to dissociation fall under two main paradigms that we call the psychiatric adaptive and the anthropological discursive. From the psychiatric perspective, dissociation is thought of mainly in terms of um, psychological function and neurobiological mechanisms. The experience of dissociation is assumed to be a direct product of underlying neurological mechanisms that is triggered functionally. The anthropological paradigm, on the other hand, treats dissociation as primarily a social and rhetorical phenomenon. Dissociation is a way of creating social space or positioning for the performance and articulation of certain types of self-experiences in particularly cultural contexts. Love that. <laughs> we have decided to create a second video about this study. It is very well done, but this video would get too long. The next thing Anna Preston talks about in her thesis is channeling. And she uh, quotes Brown's study of channeling and says it gives considerable attention to these matters. For centuries, he tells us, our culture has placed a premium on knowing clearly who we are, on being able to identify that which is other than ourselves, and on knowing what is supposed to be causing what. Because identity and control have been central to our worldview and to our sense of what and who is real, we need to consider channeling within the context of both concepts. This is a compelling point, also in consideration the influence of these cultural precepts on the development of psychological theories, theories which consequently shape our expectations and experience of health and mental illness. Brown, however, takes it in a more speculative, philosophical direction. Above all, he tells us, channeling affords an ideal vantage from which to observe the mutability of fragmentation of the self that social philosophers have identified as a key feature of postmodern modern experience. He suggests that ours is the era of the protean self, a time when personal identity is subject to constant reinvention. Explaining further, the psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton refers to the fragmented self as protean after the Greek sea god Proteus, who could magically assume different forms. Where is the protean system? <laughs> Lifton sees the unstable quality of the self, its radical fluidity, as the essential psychological trait of our time a response to a world changing at an unprecedented rate. To survive, both physically and emotionally, we must take our multi 
multiple guises, changing jobs and residences and nationalities, and struggle to find moral meaning as the ground shift beneath our feet. One of the paradoxes of the Protean self is that it simultaneously seeks multidimensionality and unity. The underlying cultural currents that produced the Protean self have given rise to diverse philosophical, therapeutical, and spiritual settings, in which a preoccupation with self-fragmentation takes center stage. Brown takes his notion quite far, claiming that self-multiplication is a culture-wide phenomenon that only occasionally veers into mental illness. His understanding of dissociation is obviously quite limited, and he reduced both its, it and channeling to a matter of grand, overarching social forces. Nonetheless, Lifton's protein self is a powerful idea. As another author explains, proteinism has moved to the center of the psychocultural stage in many societies over the last 80 years. Because of a confluence of disorienting factors such as world wars, campaigns of genocide, rapid technological and ideological change, the breakdown of moral authority, and the saturation of the mass media. These disorienting factors, so the argument goes, have led to a postmodern state in which people feel fundamentally insecure and overwhelmed by the realities of a globalized world. The protein self represents therefore an adaptation to cultural trauma wherein modern people find it impossible to make meaningful and long-term commitments to each other, to their institutions, and to the more enduring aspects of selfhood that may reside beneath beneath the surface of everyday role-playing. Interesting. <laughs> that is especially of interest here is the implication that trauma can occur on a large social scale as part of the collective experience of a given culture. After a year of COVID, my own opinion, this really speaks to me. In the New Age context, the thesis continues. At least this idea seems to resonate with many individuals' experience, and hence rejection of the dominant culture. These factors seem clearly applicable to the development of the New Age religion in particular. It is not wholly unreasonable to postulate that this proteinism also factors into the increase in channeling phenomena. However, this is not a one-way casual street. The channeled material of Jane Roberts, particularly such ideas as the multidimensional self, had a tremendous influence on New Age thinking about the nature of identity and the culturally prescribed expressions thereof. Cultural context influences individual psychology. Individual psychology is ultimately expressed in culture. Judith Herman, author of the influential work Trauma and Recovery, The Aftermath of Violence from Domestic Abuse to Political Tra Terror from 1992, states, A survivor who used association to cope with terror and helplessness may begin to marvel at this extraordinary capacity of the mind. Though she developed this capacity as a prisoner and may have become imprisoned by it as well, once she is set free, she may even learn to use her trans capability to enrich her present life rather than to escape from it. Wow. This ties into Michael Grosso's idea of creative dissociation. Not a systematic or particularly rigorous model of dissociation, but rather a loose approach that emphasizes one fact, that dissociation may indeed be used to enrich one's life, even if its origins are in trauma. Let's repeat that. That dissociation may indeed be used to enrich one's life, even if its origins are in trauma. He explains, creative dissociation may be thought of as a phase of higher association. The ordinary self seemed to lose its autonomy, but only in order to gain access to a hidden, extraordinary self. What I want to stress is that dissociation, often patently maladaptive, can also become a tool for creativity. Ordinary people may secretly harbor within themselves extraordinary poetic, imaginative, and spiritual abilities. This is a view of dissociation that Jane Roberts would probably find appealing, Anna Preston says in her thesis. Recall her own characterization of Seth as an instance of multidimensional art. 
Grosso apparently shares her belief in a superconscious or higher self, and he says, what looks like fragmentation of, or disconnectedness may in fact be a prelude to greater wholeness of higher integration. It may be that before we can reassociate on our higher level, we first have to dissociate from some aspects of lower selfhood or ordinary reality. The possibly religionist overtones to this theory need not concern us here. What is interesting about Grasso's creative dissociation is that it specifically includes an element of trauma, of violence, turmoil, and suffering as a necessary prelude to inspiration. Trauma, in this view, may ultimately lead to the triumph of inspiration over dysfunction, if interpreted within a framework of meaning that allows for it. New Age thinking may represent one such framework capable of transforming traumatic dissociation into expressions of creativity and fulfillment. We'll conclude this analysis with a quote from one of the roundtable participants on dissociation, who ends on a compelling point. This was mentioned in the thesis earlier, but we skipped over it because we're only doing highlights. It says, I think there's a reason why so many of my dissociative patients are enormously creative and talented. I have files of amazing pictures, paintings, and drawings, and poems. This is part of their dissociative experience. That indicate to me that we have, in my opinion, the wrong idea about the mind to begin with. People who have suffered this level of violence or mistreatment in childhood actually show us a more accurate picture of the mind. If this is true, that the extreme dissociation arising out of childhood trauma shows us a more accurate picture of the mind, then dissociation really is a concept of potentially paradigm-shifting importance. It suggests that dissociation does not only occur as a matter of disease or pathology, but is a fundamental feature of how the human mind works. It is highly important, then, as researchers, that we address the topic of dissociation with theoretical clarity and rigor. Does the model of trauma-related structural dissociation of the personality make sense in the context of New Age channeling, Anna Preston asks? Here we found the structural dissociation model to be lacking in several regards. It cannot account for the seemingly non-pathological manifestations apparent in channeling and is overly invested in a clinical view of trauma as inherently destructive to the individual's overall functioning and well-being. Much of the difficulty can be traced to how we understand trauma as an objective event or as an intersubjective interpretation of an event. This research supports a definition of trauma as an interpretation of events which is the result of a complex biocultural feedback loop between individual and culture. A proper appreciation for cultural and social context balances the overly clinical approach and allows that within certain contexts, for example, the new age, traumatic events may not be experienced as such or may be transformed into creative manifestations such as channeling. The trauma-based structural dissociation model gave us some key insights into the possible nature of Seth and her other voices as dissociative parts of her own personality, originating partially in the traumatic experiences of childhood. However, the case as a whole does not fit a clinically based understanding of dissociation as inherently maladaptive. Jane Roberts' dissociation took form as deeply creative and inspirational, enabling her to develop a system of meaning powerful enough to see the whole movement, the New Age movement, and inspire millions. Her motivation might indeed have had its roots in trauma and intolerable suffering, as some of Jane's more private writings suggest, and the arguably distressing, even traumatizing cultural environment of postmodern anxieties and protein identities have set the stage in which such ideas would garner widespread appeal. New Age thinking may represent a surprisingly effective and innovative response in some cases to dealing with pressures and perils of life in contemporary Euro-American culture. We might end then by asking right alongside Jane. Does Seth then represent the great portions of the psyche that we have hidden from ourselves as we pursued the one-line level of consciousness because those portions were too big to fit our puny concepts of reality? 
Only now and then those portions emerge, take psychological form as we speak, and by their very existence point out the fact that we inhabit only the surfaces of ourselves, like tiny insects hovering above the great oceans of our own souls. Maybe I had to isolate Seth for myself, but also for others, so that we could view our own greater dimensions. Under conditions bizarre enough in themselves to mock our usual concept of the self. So we highly recommend reading the full um, thesis by Anna Preston if you want to learn more. We want to thank Anna Preston for her outstanding work on this thesis and the insight it provided us all. We are currently reading the book Seth Speaks because we feel we can learn from headmates who came before us, changed the world and provided great insight while speaking freely without hiding his truth and reality. We are all for listening and believing the lived experience of people, including Rupert, Jane, Seth, and of course, yours. Thank you so much for watching this video and we hope you have a great day.